welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbara, co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, and mentor. Today's guests are Nick and Jamie Cooper, celebrating their third anniversary with Jake and Gino in August and a first wedding anniversary in November. After seeing the power of cash flowing assets in single family homes, Nick sold his remaining property and with Jamie on board, they began to reinvent on a larger scale. They saw firsthand the power of multifamily real estate investing as an opportunity to create passive income and build wealth for their family. At present, their company, Hudson Blue, owns 172 units in Texas, Alabama, Ohio, and Virginia with a total of $11.3 million assets under management. Welcome to the show, Nick and Jamie. Thank you, Thank Gino. You. <laughs> so the first thing that pops to mind, guys, is Nick, you had to get Jamie on board. Yeah, I think that for me, that was probably my my biggest uh, sale ever I had to do. <laughs> so I think, you know, we, we met, you know, four years ago. And I think that as most men can kind of attest to that you're kind of, I wouldn't say lost, but maybe a little aimless and you don't really have uh, what we say is, you know, a why. So I met mm-hmm. her and realized like, I need to really step it up. You know, mm-hmm. she, she, we sat down one day, I remember in my kitchen in my one bedroom bachelor pad. And she's like, what's your plan, buddy? What are you going to do? <laughs> I'm like, you know, I was, you know, I was 18 years in the military at that point, And I was like, well, man, I got to figure this out. So I kind of dove deep. Uh, I, I had a few rentals as far as single family. So I think that as far as someone in the military, you I say by default, you become a landlord because you buy a house and then you get stationed somewhere else. So you become a landlord. So I had a couple of houses here and there mixed in. So I started it, but I realized like, how do I kind of get bigger? And Mm -hmm. I kind of dove deep. I think I started with Bigger Pockets and I read that book, you know, this is four years ago, Dave Lindahl, Multifamily, Multifamily Millions. Mm -hmm. And uh, podcast, I devoured them i just read a bunch and then jamie's like oh my gosh you're crazy i'm like no read (laughs) read this book you know and kind of what happened is that i uh people listen to podcasts of one guy just left his phone number on there and i was calling people i was like hey why not so i called him up and at this point i had already kind of backtracked here i had you know, one, one unit left as far as one, you know, townhouse that I bought back in, you know, 2002 in San Diego. So I realized I did the math one day and I was like, oh, this thing makes about a hundred dollars a month. (laughs) And I was like, this is not, this is not a, this is not sustainable. Like this isn't, Mm -hmm. yeah, this makes me feel really good that I have a, a house in San Diego, but Jamie can attest, like, I didn't live in this house. I rented it out. It also wasn't, a business like you couldn't scale you know you could if you want to buy you know whatever 50 houses or you know whatever but in San Diego you know other parts of the country maybe but in San Diego the likelihood that we were going to be able to purchase you know 50 houses and scale and be making money I mean one house in San Diego you're talking anywhere between on the low end maybe 600 grand but right now I think the median price for a home in San Diego is well over 800,000 yeah it's and that's in areas that you probably don't want to live, which is mm-hmm. insane. <laughs> mm-hmm. So when he came to me and he said, you know, I've been for years, a landlord and, uh, with these single family homes. And at this point I have one left in San Diego. Do you want to live it in the, in the future? Do you want to live in it? And I, I had no desire to live in this house. It wasn't our dream house. And at this point, you know, we were dating, but we knew that it was going to be, you know, turning into something more serious in the future in marriage. And we didn't want to live in this house in the future. And also it wasn't something where at that point I had any idea that you could just be a normal person who did, you know, coaching, did training, read books, did all these things and go out and buy apartment complexes. So I thought he was pretty nuts when he said, I want to sell the house and I want to go buy an apartment complex out of state where my money goes a lot farther. And, uh, as a landlord, you have more, um, I guess. As a landlord, you you pretty much have, it's, you're doing a lot of stuff on your own. Yeah. But but as far as leaving California, you would have, you know, the, the tenant landlord laws are definitely not in your favor in California. And so, we wanted to get our money out of California 
and where it would go farther. And so at that point, Nick was pretty adamant. Yeah, I was pretty much determined at this point. So you you kind of kind of rewind a bit. Like you have to have a why. Like before mm-hmm. this, I didn't have a real impetus to really like do some massive action, as you say, Gino. And this is when I did it. Like I I actually told my work, I'm like, I'm taking 30 days off of, of you know, my job. Fine. And I flew out to multiple markets, toured with brokers, met with owners. And just, I went deep, you know, and Jamie's like, you're nuts. And I'm like, well, (laughs) we're selling this place. I need to place that capital somewhere. But Nick, did you do that because you met Jamie? And uh, let me, let me let the listeners in a little bit of Jamie's background as well. She's a high level, you know, medical sales representative. She, she's out there. She's, she's working the business. So you had limiting beliefs. I mean, what was holding you back from the, from the real estate thing? I mean, because you're immersed in it, you're, you're looking at it from that perspective. Why did you think he was crazy? What made you think he's crazy that he's selling a house and buying an apartment complex? You know, we've said this so many times that when you own in San Diego or you own in California, I think the ego is a crazy yeah. thing where you feel good about it. And Nick, mm-hmm. you know, he did feel good about owning, you know, homes in San Diego. And at this point, this last one, but if the math doesn't work and you're yielding a hundred dollars a month, that's not a business. You're not mm-hmm. going to be retiring on that. You're not making quote unquote passive income. That's chump change. You know, was that your aha moment though? Do you think that was your aha moment when you're looking at the numbers and you're saying, Oh wow, there's other people in the Jake and Gino community that have an asset that's worth $600 and they're yielding 10% on that money. Whereas as far as I'm yielding one or 2% on my money, was that one of those aha moments the, for you? The quick math I did was the equity I had and I did what percent it was making and it was less than 1% on my <laughs> equity. I'm like, this is this is not an investment. This uh-huh. is you are. I'm a speculator at this point. I am mm-hmm. hoping that this thing keeps value. I, I'm mean, Gene. I've been. I'm a little older than Jamie here, so I've been through the crash as a landlord and an owner of rentals, and that's when I realized like I need to have something that that makes you income. Mm-hmm. So that that equity needs to make a return. So what Nick is saying, everybody, if it doesn't cash flow, you let the grass grow. I mean, cash flow will get you out of your job, but equity will keep you out of your job. But you still need cash flow to actually help pay the bills and put some money into your pocket. That equity is great on the back end. But if you don't have cash flow on the front end, you may never get to see the equity on the back end. And let me give you guys a little. No no one retires on equity alone. You retire on cash flow. Let me give you a real quick story of a Jake and Gino student that told me of how a realtor told him to buy a home years ago in San Diego. This actually blew my mind. The financial intelligence is astounding, the lack of it. They told this person, San Diego always appreciates. So what you do is you buy the home. You don't pay your property taxes for two years. Your property is going to appreciate in value. Then you pull out the equity in your home and you pay the property taxes. And I'm thinking to myself, man, like that doesn't even make any sense to me. But this realtor was like, to your point, California always goes up in value. It always goes up in value until it doesn't. And then all of a sudden, and this is what we're seeing right now. We're seeing interest rates go up. You can't time the market. So that to me was an insane point of like, that's how you're buying in California. Nick, talk to me about that 30 day window uh, of going out there. Cause if somebody's starting out and we're really serious right now about getting into multifamily, you did a full immersion. You joined the community. You got your significant other on board, which is truly important because it's a team sport. I mean, what you, 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 one of them has the, the why and you need to paint the picture of why, uh, of why you're doing this. So getting on there and taking those 30 days, walk me through of what you went through in those 30 days. It- it was deliberate. So I needed to have a plan. So when I did in the military, I was a helicopter pilot, you know, for 22 years. And you always have to have a, a, a plan of action. You know, you have to have everything set out. And I realized like, hey, my plan of action is I need to find somewhere to to place this money because I sold my uh, my last rental and you have a timeline with your 1031. Mm-hmm. And this is a different market. You know, it's almost four years ago, uh, three years ago. And you have to put that money somewhere or you get taxed on it. So my big impetus was I have to show my partner here <laughs> that this is, I'm not some crazy person. And just, you know, I, I was at the time 40, I'm a little older now. And, <laughs> you know, you, you're pivoting from something that, you know, like I'm a pilot, this is what I know. And I'm like, well, how do I apply all these things I've learned over 22 years? I'm like, that's what I did. I had a plan and it just usually I had a whole staff to kind of execute for me. I was everyone. I was the, <laughs> the staff, the planner, the maintenance, the pilot, you know, the door gunner, all that stuff. 
So just making sure you have a plan. And, and like, I'll go back to the why, like, this is why I was doing it. I had to, you know, provide for eventually, like, you know, we're going to get married and have a family. And that's, that's what you have to do. And, and I think that's how you take control of your life is, is you make, you do action and not just like depend what life gives you. Like, oh, okay, mm -hmm. this is why I had to go find our own way. Nick so is Nick very deliberate with everything mm -hmm. he does. So, you know, when you're asking me, how did you get on board? The real reason is I had known him long enough to where I knew when Nick decides to do something, it isn't, it isn't just like a spontaneous combustion of, oh, I want to do this. All spontaneous, you know? Well, <laughs> but with his decisions, he's yes, very, yes. very deliberate. He's deliberate and he takes action and he has a plan. And that's what most attracted me to him because mm. even though he wasn't in the real estate when we met, everything he does is very deliberate, calculated, has a plan and does all the research that he needs to know that he wants to do something. Mm -hmm. And so when he did tell me he wanted to do this, yes, it did seem crazy, but he had been devouring podcasts, devouring books on multifamily. And for years while he was deployed, he thought about doing multifamily years ago. And he had told me about that when we met. And he's like, I ordered all these books. I did all this stuff. But to really transition into something like this, I'm gone six to nine months a year. I wasn't here long enough to make that type of decision. And this was the first time in his life that he was here long enough to be like, okay, I'm transitioning out of the military in the future because it's the, it's towards the end of my career. And also his job's very dangerous flying. You know, he flew the Seahawk helicopter. Like this isn't, this isn't just being a pilot and, you know, getting to go on a few days a week on a Delta flight. Like this is a very tactical, he did high level stuff in the military. That's mm -hmm. so dangerous and so scary and not great when you're thinking about a wife and children. So, so let me ask you, I, I was going to make fun of Nick a little bit, but now that you've answered yeah. the question, but let, let me make, you had a plan of action as a pilot, right? You have certain checks, certain controls. That's why flying is one of the safest because there's so many redundancy. There's so many things that you need to do. And I was going to ask you, why didn't you have a plan of action for your life, for your finances? And, and you, and you answer that question because if you're overseas for six months, there's no consistency. There's no, you, you come back and you go back and come back and come and go back. And uh, I give you kudos for lasting 22 years because that's a long time to be dedicated to a craft. And then in the meanwhile, having that epiphany of like, well, this is great, but I've grown up now and I need to do something with my family. Nick, you pitched on multifamily. How did you pitch her on joining Jake and Gino? Because she must be like, another, we're going to spend more money to do this. See, Nick, you're you're doing this all on your own. I got to go to events with these people. Well, Come on, Nick. I think you're killing what, what me what here. Down to is, so I've been a flight instructor for most of my career. And I realized like, can I teach myself you know, looking back, you know, to fly, like, no, probably not. I had someone teach me. Mm. So I think the biggest thing you have to look for is how do you, we were going to get there no matter what, but how do I kind of like not short circuit, but kind of make that, that, that graph go up a little, you know, mm -hmm. more vertical. And I think that the biggest thing we did is that Jamie and I invested in, you know, the Jake Gino community, which is, you know, an investment, but it's an investment in our future. Mm -hmm. And that's what he said. He said, mm -hmm. you know, we're making an investment in our future. How can we put this insane amount of money in all of these properties and not have people who have gone before us and successfully executed this? And for us to do this successfully, which is what I want to transition into, we need to be guided by people who have a proven track record. Mm, I, yeah, I love think, that answer. I think what, what Jamie is also saying kind of is before we are kind of amateurs, you know, and now once we start in the multifamily space, it's a business you have to be a professional. Like there's a saying out there that amateurs, you know, cost you money, professionals save you money. Mm -hmm. So that's why I realized we had to look at this as a business. Mm -hmm. And I remember in November of 2020, in the midst of COVID, I fly into San Diego and we have the event in San Diego. I think that's maybe the first time we met. And San Diego, it never rains that weekend. It oh, rained yeah. all weekend. Never rains in San Diego. It's got to pick the weekend that Jake and Gino go to visit San Diego. And we snuck in. And I remember COVID had just reopened. And then you guys, like the week after, re-shut down. But that was an amazing event. And what I loved about it is you get to meet the community. You get to meet the people who, who embody the community. And it's a lot of spouses, a lot of couples, a lot of people just trying to make themselves better. And it's the peer group. You 
want to raise the level of that peer group, you're able to go out and partner out with other people. But I'll never forget that. Event. I mean, San Diego's got some amazing food, everybody. You talk about like Thai, you talk about the sushi out there. I it was blown away by it. It's just a, it's just an amazing place to live. And I can see the, the allure of living there. But then sometimes with the cost of living and all that, I see you wanting to shift out. Let, let's let's jump into that first deal. How did you guys come about that first deal? Because you guys were on Closer's Club. Uh, was it five or six? I don't even remember which one it was. I don't remember. Which um, I think you guys. I don't know which one it was. but I, I think it was Closer's Club 5. And it was if we can talk about that deal specifically, because that was an amazing freaking deal. Because like you're going out of the market, going back. And, and for those of you that are not living in the market, listen to this, because this is important because you don't have it doesn't have to be in your backyard for you to even to start out with. So can we dive into that deal real quick, Nick? Yeah, I think that's the one you're talking about the the, the first deal we did, Gino. Yeah, so, yes, uh, yeah. yeah. So that's the one kind of kind of getting back to that is that that's when I went to the market. It was actually Ohio, so I flew out there. I think it was three times in a month, and I stayed for a week at a time, rented a car, and then I just did everything that I thought you should do. You know, I met with brokers, other owners, property managers, um, all that, all that, and uh, at, at the whole time listening to podcasts the entire time in the car in the car all day. And I think it's just Jamie's like, what are you doing? You're taking off work here. Like, even work is like, you're doing what? You're going to Ohio in February? I'm like, yeah, yeah I'm going to Ohio in February. So, time out one second. If Jamie wasn't truly on board, she'd have been like, Nick, you're fooling around. It's time to get home. What are we doing out there? But the fact that you pitched her and you sold her on it and you're committed, and that's the thing, you weren't out there just having fun because no one goes out to Ohio in February to have fun, right? I mean, that, that's the bottom line. So, she knows you're putting in the hours, she knows you're grinding. And I mean, that's that's the epitome of having great teamwork, understanding that there are sacrifices out there and that you painted that picture of financial freedom. Paint that picture to your significant other, because for my wife, my wife, as you saw last night, we had a group coaching call. I said she yeah. could care less about money. It's not money is not to her, but the optionality, what money can provide for you is what's really, truly important. And that's why you're out in Ohio. You're not out there to cash flow to make money, but you're out there to be able to control your freedom and to be able to say to Jamie, when we're ready to have a family, we can have a family. When you're ready to leave your job, you can leave your job because we have this other income coming in. That's what that trip to February was all about. And just being able to paint that picture to your significant other is truly important for all the listeners out there. Because you may have some naysayers, and it does take a little bit of time. And you know what? Maybe Jamie should have come with you for 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 a couple of days and seen the pain that you're going through, talking to brokers, underwriting the deals, looking at the deals. So I'm uh, sorry to interrupt. Continue with the story, you but know, I just thought I have that was... come on a lot of property tours and a lot of <laughs> broker tours at this point. I didn't even go on the first one, but I did yes. that. I did that entire walkthrough on our first property and have done them since on every property, every unit. All right. That's awesome. That's great. So that yes. first deal, how'd you find the first deal? So linked up. So like I said, we, people like I cold called someone on bigger pockets that, that, you know, was in the area and they said, Hey, I have, I may have a deal coming up. It's not our contract yet. So we linked up and just uh, was able to 1031 exchange into that. And it's been, you know, pretty, pretty, I mean, since th it's been three years now. And like, I think Gina is, you know, we refied out uh, last year and it was, wow. you know, significant, you know, capital event, we like to call it. <laughs> so that's when I realized I did the math with my military and what I'm doing here. I'm like, I need to retire. <laughs> it, it's like, what am I doing? Like, so this is, this is the conveyor belt, everybody. You, you put on a deal and all of a sudden we discussed the conveyor belt in real estate, putting on a deal. And what he said, it was a significant capital event. You refi, you're matriculating that equity. And even if it takes 24 months or 36 months, three years seems like a lot of time, that significant capital is where you get to put the money into the next deal or that next opportunity. And how many units was the deal? How big was the deal? Is, uh, it was 20, 24 units. So it was, uh, you know, 1960s vintage. So it was kind of like a standard working class, kind of stuff you always preach to Gino, blue mm -hmm. collar. Um, it may not seem exciting, but it, it actually is very exciting. And three. Years well, it's later. exciting when you can pull all your capital out, isn't it? I mean, that's that's the thing. It's not a house in San Diego, everybody. It's not near the beach. But guess what? I'm guess guessing it cash flow is a hell of a lot more than the asset. And that's the understanding, everybody, that becoming a multifamily entrepreneur, understanding the numbers, understanding what you're trying to accomplish. There are people out there who successfully 
invest for equity, but there's a lot of risk in that in that model. And then just flipping and flipping, it's transactional. At the end of the day, you got to continue to do it. You've bought this asset now. What were the value adds on this asset? What did you like about the asset? Value, value adds are pretty much uh, replacing management, uh, the standard we're using expenses, uh, building back utilities. So some of them, you know, we, we, we paid for water. Now we actually bill it back. And uh, I think also just like exterior improvements. And then as tenants or residents kind of left, we just improved the units. So that was the big, the big value right there. I think and though the with this property, one of the biggest, I would say unique things we have found that we haven't experienced as much with some of our other properties, but the bit, the hardest sell on this property after Nick got me on board was actually getting the seller to want to sell. So this man was definitely, you know, the traditional mom and pop. He was in his, you know, late eighties, mid eighties, and his wife had died. He would had this property for decades. It was mm. an emotional attachment for him. It wasn't a business. He wasn't running it like a business. People were not, some people, you know, hadn't ever had their rent raised in 15 years. <laughs> and, you know, wow. when we bought the property, the biggest hurdle was after we did the walkthrough him deciding whether or not he really wanted to sell it still, because he was so afraid of having some big conglomerate come in and not have, you know, care and love for the property like he did. And so we flew out there together and had lunch with him. We took him to lunch and we just let him know who we were. We let him know what we were about, that this was you know, you were going to be selling to, to Jamie and Nick, to Jamie, Jamie and Nick, not to some big conglomerate, not to people who aren't going to care. We're going to care about your property. We're going to, you know, care about your tenants. We're going to be able to put more capital than you've been able to, to really improve the property and make this, you know, a community for your tenants and your residents, you know, and that's really important. I think that's something that we lose focus on is these are people's homes and yes, we want to make money. And of course we have to make money. It's a business, but more than anything, you know, for this being our first property, it was so invaluable to be able to speak to the owner and really understand for him what selling this was and making sure that we could execute what he had provided for so many years. Uh <laughs> I gotta pull the I gotta pull the e-break a second, guys, because this is the golden nugget for the podcast. There's gonna be tons of them, and there have been. But what what Jamie's really talking about is principled negotiation versus positional bargaining. The average investor who is not in an education program, who's not in a community, is going to hammer on uh, the price, price, price. What she did is she she negotiated on principle. She understood the spy technique, seller property you she understood that there's value that the seller's looking for he's not looking just for price he's looking for legacy and she understood that that there's there's the negotiation when you when you negotiate by by principle you're negotiating on points you're negotiating on value and that to me is what's made this deal go through because a lot of other people could have gone in they could have paid more money than you could have made it a more secure deal because you guys haven't done a deal yet you have no credibility you're out of state blah 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 but the fact that you spent an extra couple thousand bucks to fly back out there, take him out to lunch, sit in front of the person face to face. He's a mom and pop. You know that they're not sophisticated. And there's a lot of those deals still out there because people are saying, well, why won't they raise rents? They're not running it like a business. But that principal negotiation, if there was more of that in real estate where you can add value to each other's sides, that's how you get the deal done. So it's principled versus positional bargaining, where most of us do that one off. I mean, if you want to call it win win, win lose, whatever that, whatever term you want to call it, but positional is just, I want this price, I want these terms, and take it or leave it. So that was, uh, that, that, that was awesome that you did it, that you had the wherewithal and the understanding to like, let's, let's figure out how we can satisfy this seller. Great job. I think that's why we make such a, a great, you know, team is just because it's not just, when you think about multifamily or any business, yes, there's a science behind it, which is the underwriting, the demographics and whatnot, but there is a lot of art to it. And I think that's a lot what Jamie brings to, to our, you know, partnership is, is that, you mm -hmm. know, that, that soft touch, you know, that, that artistry that, you know, Excel spreadsheet can't, you know, like, Hey, this is the price. This is it. You know, like, no, you, you have to, to get, you know, may look good on paper, but you have to have someone mm -hmm. that kind of gets that across the finish line. And that's, that's Jamie. I love that. And then you got this deal closed. What was the next deal look like? What did that next deal look like? How long did it take you to get the next one? It, it took, took us a while. Yeah. 
took us about a year and a half or so. So how did you guys stick in? Because most people will quit. And, and for Jake and myself, it was the opposite. It took us 18 months to find the first deal. But then after the first deal, it was three months after the first deal. And then six months after that. So within a year, we had almost 200 units. But it took us a long time to stick in there. How did you guys take that long before you got your second deal? How did you stick with it before you got the second deal? I think that one of the biggest things, even though a year and a half when you're in it does feel like a long time, it's really not that long of a time as people who were brand new to buying multifamily. And I think it actually was the perfect amount of time because if it had been sooner, we, you know, we hadn't yet built up credibility with our own portfolio, meaning mm -hmm. that first property is all just Nick and Maya's money. That's yeah. it. No investors, mm -hmm. no friends, no one but our own. So if we were going to make mistakes or we were going to fumble, which we knew would, you know, likely happen in some capacity, we didn't want to be having the burden of running a property successfully and worrying about our friends and family's money for that first property. It's mm -hmm. a whole nother level of stress. And, you know, you have made, you have made essentially a promise <laughs> to these people that you are going to provide the return you said. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of pressure. And so that first property, I think it was perfect that it was just us. And after a year and a half, we had learned so much. Yeah. And then we felt more confident to be able to offer a syndication model where we allowed other people to invest as um, limited partners. And they were able to, you know, not have to sign on the loan, not have to take any of that risk. And they didn't have to run the day to day. And the great thing is, you know, Nick was able to decide that this was where we were headed and do this full time. Mm -hmm. And in that year and a half that gave us the wherewithal, the experience and, you know, Nick is a numbers guy. He is down to the nit noids with Excel. That is not me at all, but I married someone who is that way. And that's who you want running your property. And that's who you want to invest with. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, all those little things we learned before that second property are why our other properties will be successful. Mm -hmm. What's that transformation look like now that you guys have gotten into the business full time and you're doing it full time and it, it it really surrounds your day? I mean, Jamie, you're you're working full time still. Nick is doing the business full time. He leans on you. How does that how does your day look now? I think it's very planned. So the day, I mean, my Monday through Friday is, is very planned. So I'm very deliberate about what happens during the day. So I wake up every day before 5 a.m. and I have a, an accountability call, which is not real estate related at all. And we go over our goals, you know, daily goals, weekly goals, monthly goals, quarterly, yearly, and so on. And you kind of, you take account of that and they hold you accountable. And I think that's something that's mm -hmm. been really great for me is that you have to structure your day or else it just gets away from you. And I think I learned that in the military, you you really have to be, have some structure to, yes, you can flex off of it. Uh, but the, I think just that's what's kind of helped me now is just having that Monday through Friday, especially structured. Friday but how does it feel though? How is the feeling that you're able to control your own destiny, that you're able to say, hey, I, I want to move to Florida. And if I want to move to Florida, great. Hey, I want to move to Texas. Just that idea of having all those options. Whereas when you're in the military, you're flying out six months of the year. You don't know where your next house is. You don't know how you're going to start a family. Now you have all those options because multifamily has allowed you to have those options. And it's only taken you three years from when you started to have those options now. I think it feels like the freedom is what is really helpful as far as that's what, you know, we have, like you said, options is the thing. Like when you have a, a W-2 and no shade W-2. I had one for 22 years. Is like, you do what they tell you, especially mm -hmm. in the military. Like it's, it's very simple because you deploy, everything's taken care of. You know, all I have to do is my job, get up and fly. It's like food, every, shelter, everything. I just show up. And with this here, it's like, whatever you kill, you eat. You know, people mm -hmm. aren't killing it for me. Like if I don't work hard, no money comes in. Mm -hmm. Nick, I have a little secret for you. Um, I'm married to my wife, Julia, as you know. My food, my shelter, my clothing are all pretty much taken care of. As you found you're out like, last you're night. Like in the so. military, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was, that's the first thing that ran into my mind. I'm like, wow, he's describing my life pretty much. And as you guys know, last night, she even packs my bags when I go on vacation. So it's a pretty good gig I got going on. And is that what you're telling me? <laughs> uh, it's, it's very close. But... Gino, don't give him too many ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And Jamie, for you, like the optionality, the ability to say, hey, if I want to start a family, I can homeschool a family if I want to. Uh, I mean, 
did you even know that I was on the spectrum five years ago or 10 years ago working in, in, in pharmaceutical sales? No, when we met, I had, you know, had, I think at that point I had six years, seven years in medical sales and I was making pretty good money. And I had the mindset, you know, the traditional mindset that I was raised with. I, I was raised by a single mom. She did, you know, the best she could and gave me everything she could, but it was, it was a struggle living in California. And she definitely instilled in me, you know, you go to college, you get a good job, you save your money, you buy a house, you invest in your 401k and you live happily ever after. That's great, you know, maybe 50 years ago, but that's just mm-hmm. not realistic these days, especially with inflation and expenses and, you know, cost of living in California. And, you know, you try retiring on your 401k with inflation right now, like it, it's probably well, not possible for my generation. To jump onto that too with, with Jamie here is that my military retirement, yes, I'm retired, but I'm still working. Like I, I tell all folks in the military, the day comes eventually when you have to leave. And it really is, it's retirement, but really I say it's, it's a false retirement because I don't know any one of my friends who's not working right now that just retired from the military after say like 20 years, everyone's working. Mm-hmm. It's not possible to stay home because you've been doing it your whole life. You've been, you, you, you have that adrenaline going to work and it's something where I think multifamily has allowed you to choose on something that you like. It's an amazing vehicle to create that wealth. And I mean, the tax benefits, I mean, you have a million dollars in your 401k, you really have 600 grand once you take out taxes and all other opportunity costs and fees like that. So l- looking at it from that perspective, understanding that uh, is really awesome. Guys, where can the listeners get a hold of you to learn more about your company, learn about what you're doing, baby invest in any opportunities email address you want to throw out a cell number i'd love to have the cell number as well yeah that. so our uh we have a website which is hudson blue hudson like the river blue like the color mf multifamily it's just mf though dot com and that's our website and then we have a social media instagram it is hudson blue mf on Instagram <laughs> mm. and, uh, and then I give out my cell phone. So yeah, call me, text me, uh, whatever, uh, 619 area code nine, nine, zero eight, eight, four, eight. So if anyone wants to talk real estate or anything, just, uh, shoot me a text, phone call, all that stuff. And the reason why I want you, Nick, to give your phone number out, there's a lot of people in military and there's a lot of people in the military who are in Jake and Gino. They're just stuck. They don't know what to do, you know, how to go. Maybe they want to start investing in real estate. They might want to start investing passively with you. Then they want some information on education. I think you can be an inspiration to them because a lot of the people in the military, they don't have the entrepreneurial mindset when they're there. But once they leave, they have that spark in them. They're like, how do I get into this? So having you being able to be a role model to them, I think is a really big help because I've seen the shift in a lot of the Jake and Gino community members who were in military. They grab this thing and they start running with it because they understand with the military, your systems, you guys are building teams. There's it's so translatable to getting into the multifamily space where we have students who are in Hawaii, big shout out to Vince, who is in Hawaii investing in El Paso, Texas. How do you do that? You have to be forward thinking. You have to create a plan. Like you said, you have to have systems and operations and building teams out there. So there's so many skills that can really translate from the military into get into multifamily. So go back there, make sure that you give Nick a call. If you're thinking about it, if you're in the military, And if I could just recap the show just real quick, I mean, I think Nick's life really started when he met Jamie. Not going to say. And and the the reason why I I think I don't want to say he was just doing things repetitively. Same kind of thing. I was stuck in the rut as well. Going to work, flying the helicopters. And after a while, it just gets a little boring. And you want something more in your life. And, And then when you when you meet somebody and that person pushes you to be a better version of yourself, you're like, I have to step it up here. I know I've got more potential than what I'm doing and I'm doing great things, but I want to be able to create wealth and I want to be able to create a legacy. And this person is starting to push me because I see how well she's doing in her job and she's crushing it there, but her job is transactional. She's got to go do it every day. We're not creating wealth from that. And we don't believe in the 401k model. We don't believe in, in all that. So what do I need to do? Oh, I like this multifamily things. I've been a landlord for a little bit of a little bit of time, and I see that I bought this house for three hundred grand in San Diego eighteen years ago, and now it's worth eight hundred grand. And I didn't do anything. And I'm looking at that. How do I place that money? Get that money out there because the equity is not really making a return. Let me find a couple of markets. I joined Jake and Gino. I surround myself with amazing people. I find a coach. The coach helps me out, but. 
It's all on me because I have to take massive action. Education is great, but education times action will lead you to your results. Getting on a plane and actually staying in a market one week and a month in February in Ohio. Sorry, Ohio. I want to keep killing you, but you guys have 290 days a year with no sun. Enough said. I mean, like it doesn't get any worse than that, but you're there in February. You're doing property tours. You're working deals. You find a 24 unit. You put it on the contract. You talk to the old mom and pop seller. You make him feel calm and confident that you guys can close the deal. And then all of a sudden you close the deal. 18 months later, you get into your next deal. And while you're getting into your next deal, this first deal is starting to matriculate and you have a significant capital event. We all know what that means, baby. It's refi and roll, pull that money out, put it into the next deal and you keep going. And then you're just, the other thing that I think people have to understand is it's great to have a community, but if you're not part of the community, if you're not going to the events, if you're not getting on the, on the accountability calls, if you're not getting on the group coaching calls, if you're not talking to other students, it's all for naught. So you really have to understand your why. And Nick had touched that upon that earlier on in the show. So go back and listen to that and try to formulate your why and what your values are and then figure that out. And multifamily can fit into that box. And I think that's the important thing as far as having multifamily have that leave that legacy for you and be able to build the business. And, and the other thing I'd like to say is if you're doing this with the spouse or significant other, if you're not, make sure you get them on board. They may not like it. My wife has no idea what the hell a cap rate is. I don't even know what a cap rate is, to be honest with you, but she definitely doesn't know what a cap rate is. So they don't have to understand the vehicle, but they have to understand why you're doing it. And then to bring them to some tours, maybe to have them talk to some brokers and get them involved and make them understand the business and see the vision and to paint that picture of financial freedom looks like because it's different to everybody but making people understand your significant other why we're doing this is really important so i just wanted to thank you both for being on the show uh what was the what was the uh, website again jamie hudson blue mf.com and if anyone wants to reach out any spouse that's hesitant about this i cracked the code <laughs> any any spouse that's <laughs> hesitant about this or about you joining this community of so many amazing people we've made so many friends not just you know business relationships but genuine friendships we've hosted dinners at our house we've had people come mm -hmm. you know from florida and colorado and come stay in our home that are from the community you know these have become our people and so this is just been a great community. And my biggest, you know, my biggest kind of thing I want to throw out there is as someone who's such a saver, I was very stressed at first about the investment that we were putting on our education in this. And this has been, you know, such a invaluable investment for our family. And you can't, like Nick said, learn to fly a plane or a helicopter without a coach. And so mm -hmm. that, you know, that's it. I love that. I want to thank you both for being an amazing guest on the show and, and sharing your movers and shakers story. It's important to get it out there, everybody. Now, if you like the show, please leave us a review. Until next time, let's all go out there and make it a movers and shakers week. See you, everybody. See you. Bye, thank guys. You.